Okay, well, I'll just get started because there's a fair number of questions here. Is there any relationship between self-awareness and the quality of knowing slash chitta? Can someone have a very refined state of knowing and still do unwholesome things? The answer is yes. Um, if so, how to prevent the unwholesome? Thank you. So to prevent the unwholesome, we need wisdom. So we need to actually see the suffering that our actions are creating or that our unwholesome mental states are creating. The, the reason the Buddha classed things as wholesome and as unwholesome is because if it's wholesome, it leads to a well-being and a lessening of suffering. And if it's classed as unwholesome, it leads to more suffering, greater suffering and increase and more sustained suffering. If the Buddha classed something as good, it means it leads toward the ending of suffering. And if he classes something as bad, it means it's going to cause more suffering. So the Buddha wasn't just giving judgments in that sense, but it was wholesome and unwholesome, good or bad, based on the creation or the non-creation of suffering. So self-awareness, very much being aware of the results of our actions, being aware of any suffering our actions of body, speech, and mind might create. So yeah, I take the ones from the bottom. Maybe those are from yesterday. Yeah, I recognize these. Okay. Thank you so much for offering a monastic retreat for lay people. Can you describe the relationship between anchoring attention to a primary object and, underlined, a right focus in samadhi that is firmly established in the heart from a bodily experience? Is this like qigong? Ground and sky, cloud hands, head centered over tailbone, a harmony? There certainly is a harmony. But even if you don't, you don't really need to do qigong for this. Uh, qigong just helps balance, uh, helps the circulation in the body. So that that can be a great help to meditation. But actually, what we're talking about here is the mind. And it says a right focus in samadhi that is firmly established in the heart. But samadhi, coming back to that Thai definition, is the firm establishing of the heart from a bodily experience. So the body will, chances are the body will be, body will be more at ease, less tense. Maybe, maybe some more ways of coming back to this question will come up in the, in the future questions because it's kind of a multifaceted question. Dear Ajahn, during the sitting meditation, the breathing is very fading and disappeared. The pain is there but no longer bothers my awareness, no longer feel my body existence sometime. The two things left are my awareness and the knowing, and I only focus on my awareness to the knowing of all senses available. Am I doing it correctly? Wow, I wish I could do that. Um, yeah, sometimes, uh, like Ajahn Chah would talk about the uh, sensation of the breath fading or disappearing or, or the breath in deep meditation actually stopping. So uh, if the mind is clear and, and it's not not really uh, falling asleep or in a dream state, then I suppose you are doing it correctly. Dear Ajahn, if somebody would like to become a monk, how can they realize when the time comes or has come to receive ordination? How can they make that decision? One of my family members became a monk in Myanmar years ago, quite out of the blue, at least to us. Thank you. Hmm. 
I think it's kind of mysterious. It'll be different for each person why, why you would take ordination. I think, uh, personally, I, because I strongly believe in past lives and past karma, past causes and conditions, so uh, that could really strongly play into it. If, if you've actually been ordained before in past lives, then there will be that impression there and that perhaps that desire to move in that direction. Or it can be based on some sort of suffering. Like for myself, I feel that suffering in a way kind of pushed me into the robes. So it could be through suffering. There's different reasons people ordain. But you only really know for yourself. I think if, if you decide to ordain and all of a sudden everything just starts falling into place, that's uh, probably a pretty strong sign that it's, you're moving in the right direction and that it's right for you. Um, like, for example, for myself, uh, all through middle school and high school, I was always very nervous and self-conscious. And I, I had the bad habit of biting my nails, nervous habit. And as soon as I decided to ordain, that habit stopped and never re-arose. So there was a very clear change. So if somebody decides to ordain and there's a very clear change like that, like suddenly you feel like you're on the right track, then I think each person really has to know for themselves about these things. Dear Ajahn, do you recommend running as a way of meditation? If so, is there anything I should do differently? What should I focus on? Hmm. Running meditation. So, <laughs> so you could do, uh, maybe you could do just very, very fast walking meditation. <laughs> Back and forth. Because running, you know, if you're doing running, uh, a walking meditation path isn't going to be quite long enough. I think running as exercise could work. I'm not I'm not sure if running as a meditation would be that great of a thing to do because um, if you're doing harder physical activity, then um, it's not so much leading to calming. So we're looking at calming through meditation. Like when we do walking meditation, even Ajahn Shah, he would do f fast walking meditation, but he would say that helped him, helped his mind to get peaceful. And I suppose sometimes if if someone's a runner and maybe they get runners high or something, then the mind could become peaceful. I ran cross, cross country in college and I could get runners high and the mind would become peaceful a little bit, but then it's really dependent on that, on that hit of endorphins. And meditation really is different. It's not about, it's not about that kind of getting that kind of high. So, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't really recommend it as a form of meditation. This is what should I focus on? I would say I would focus on slowing down. <laughs> hmm. This is a good question. Please give us a few meditation objects and a description and reason of how to use them. So, uh, for myself as a forest monk, I've I've kind of refrained from doing this in terms of suggesting meditation objects. And there's a few meditation objects we generally suggest to lay people. And that would be like metta, using metta as a meditation object. Because an object doesn't just have to be a, a still object. It can actually be a reflection or an analytical meditation, a contemplation. Also the breath, of course. The breath being the main object is the foundation. So that can be the sensation of the breath at the nostrils, and some people it's more prominent at the stomach. So for example, if we're doing Qigong, we're using the stomach, but during meditation, it doesn't matter whether the stomach or the chest is expanding. And for myself, I use the sensation at the nostrils if I'm focusing on the breath meditation. Also, uh, Budho is a really common meditation object in the Thai forest tradition. Budho is uh, practiced where when we're breathing in, if the sensation of the breath at the nostrils is too subtle, 
we can combine it with the meditation word butho. So when we breathe in, we're mentally reciting but, and when we breathe out, we're mentally reciting to. So that's that's butho meditation, and it's also taught that if that's too slow of a recitation, then you can breathing in you can recite butho and breathing out butho in the mind. Other than that, it might be helpful sometimes to chant internally or even to chant quietly externally to do a certain certain number of chants. For example, the Itipiso Bhagava Arahang Samma Sambuto, this this chant that we do can be done over and over again to help focus the mind and used as a meditation object. Then there's more the more monastic meditation objects, which I'll just speak of a, a little bit. I was reading a sutta just the other day, and the Buddha's talking about factors of our hardship, factors of developing the mind. And one thing he says is here, one a monk has an excellent meditation object. And he says, well, what is an excellent meditation object? And he says, an, an image of a skeleton is an excellent meditation object. An image of a bloated corpse is an excellent meditation object. An image of a corpse being devoured by worms is an excellent meditation object. So this is the body contemplation combined with the death contemplation. And we do this to really cool the mind down but we generally don't teach the details of those things uh, to lay people, but it's good to know about them. And some people might actually find them useful. So those are very, you know, for myself, I try to use those types of objects all the time. Those uh, imagining, like uh, combining with the breath meditation and imagining my own skeleton and the, the skull and everything behind the flesh and just imagining and, and f trying to feel where the where the different bones are and how what they might look like and how that really is a good entry point into not self and it really strips away any idea of just any sense of self consciousness con uh, or just being overly concerned with uh, the external things and thinking well the the skeleton is just very still and it's very uh, it's very solid, so and it's just it's in in there all the time. It's the reason I can talk and move my mouth. It's holding the body up. Ajahn Chah would say uh, they would have a they had a skeleton, and, and a lot of the Thai forest monasteries they'll have a skeleton hanging in the Dhamma hall, so that people can sit in front of it and contemplate a skeleton and use it as their meditation object and get a really good visual of it burned into their minds. And some people would be very superstitious about this and would come, they would complain that uh, there's a skeleton here, this is very scary and it might create some bad energy here. And Ajahn Chah would say, well, you have, a, you have a skeleton inside of you all the time and you're carrying it around everywhere you go. He said, what would be really scary is if you didn't have a skeleton, <laughs> what would that be like? <laughs> So uh, that can be a good contemplation as well. Meditation, ob those are just a few different meditation objects without going into the whole 40 kamatanas and the Visuddhi Magga. Those are, those are some common ones. Hmm. Can you address right livelihood for someone who's retired and no longer has to earn a living? Well, that, that's pretty easy. If you don't have to earn a living, you can just choose something wholesome to do. Uh, you could volunteer. I, I know people who volunteer at national parks. They use their retirement to volunteer in national parks or do some sort of cleanups. Or there, There's just a whole bunch of wholesome things that could be done with retirement. It really is good to do something with your retirement unless you're really infirm or not able to use your body at all or if you have some serious health problem because we, we do need to try, to try to find skillful ways to use our time. So there's a whole... There's a whole range of, of things that could be done and uh, generosity, um, volunteering even at monasteries or helping out, helping out at the monastery in some way or just, uh, yeah, a whole, there would be a whole bunch of things that could be done that would fall within li right livelihood 
for someone who's retired. Ajahn, referring to a Dhamma talk a couple nights ago, you mentioned about how do we know that we have progress in Dhamma. I would like to point out, you said less angry. If I can manage less angry, but people that surround you or family that surround you do not create the environment that support you to be less angry. <laughs> How will you do any advice? Uh, I already tried letting go of it. <laughs> I tried to walk away from that situation, but it accumulates in the subconscious. Sadhu. <laughs> you just have to try harder. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is uh, with friends and family. This is this is really where we get tested. So if, if we were just surrounded by strangers, we wouldn't know them. and. We wouldn't have much relationship with them, if any. So, so really, with family, this is the kind of things we have to deal with. And I remember talking with Long Pa Pasano one time about this, um, because actually I, I saw his mother admonish him one time, and he's she's the only person in the world I've ever seen who's able to like point something out to to Long Pa, and. Uh, I was with him, and we were traveling together with with his mother, and uh, and so I I said I made the comment something like, "Wow, you know, even those even people who have been monks for so long, like your your parents really will our parents know how to push our buttons." And he said, "It's not that they know how to push our buttons; they put them there." <laughs> So I think, and children can do that too. They find not only do they, um, not only will they be able to push our buttons, but they'll they place new buttons there that and then push them. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, this is actually this is a honing stone for our wisdom, and this is actually a good thing. This is actually a good thing, and so whether it's, you know, whatever family members are able to push our buttons, then it really can help us and see, well, those latent tendencies towards anger really are still there. It's not that it's their fault I'm getting angry. It's really the way I'm reacting. So this, this happens in the monastery as well. I might think, oh, oh this or that com community member can really push my buttons. But then I think, well, that's just something, that's a, hon a honing stone for my wisdom. And it's like Lung Por Cha said that he didn't really gain really sharp wisdom until he was an abbot, until he was the abbot of Wat Papong and really had a large following and a large body of students that he really honed his wisdom. There was one kind of extreme case where he became really upset with a novice who wouldn't listen to him. And then he, he became enraged at this novice and was chasing him across the monastery with his stick. And the novice was running away. And then he, but Ajahn Chah saw that, and this was very early on at Wat Pong, and he saw that he, he was so angry, he, he still couldn't control his anger. So then he went into his kuti for three days and didn't come out and was just to look at anger. And after that, he never did anything like that again. So you could see that yeah, probably this novice really genuinely did something that would make any normal person really, really angry. But as a monk, as a practitioner, then Ajahn Chah ended up having to look at that. And so that's that's really what we do, have to do with with family members, with friends who, who might end up talking about us behind our backs or, or just uh, people who might, we feel might have betrayed us, then well, Ajahn Amaro said something I thought was quite profound during his visit. He, he said, he never feels betrayed by anyone these days. I said, oh, that's, I thought that's, kind of, that's pretty interesting. Because he thought, well, if people come to the monastery and he puts a lot of effort into training them and then they leave, he said, well, it was still, he was still engaging in good action and he doesn't feel like he has really any expectations for anybody to treat him a certain way. And, but that only comes after years of really honing that wisdom on the sharpening stone of 
being with who we might consider difficult people. Another angle is, have we ever treated anybody like that before? So maybe this is our kama as well. What goes around comes around and to really deeply consider. I know for myself, most of the time I get irritated by somebody. I can actually think of an instance where I did the same thing to somebody else. So that's actually a very good reflection as well. <laughs> That's just what I was talking about. Dear Ajahn, could you give advice for us, please, when a friend acts like an enemy <laughs> because the misunderstanding and communication broke down? Uh, she kind of shut off, shows unkindness, and is resentful. I have tried to talk or communicate, but haven't. it hasn't worked. Sometimes sharing merit as an aspiration for her and everyone. I felt sorry for her, but my mind is peaceful and want her to be contented. So yeah, this is the same thing as have we ever really deeply asking ourselves how, what part do we have to play in the situation? So if we're always taking a superior stance, then... Uh, if we're always thinking, well, I'm the one who's in the right here, and rather than what we have to do is actually try to deeply to deeply consider where is the other person coming from. So if we truly want to be in harmony with somebody else in a situation like this, then it's very important to very deeply consider, have I ever acted like that before, or is there some way I've been speaking that I haven't been aware of so communication breakdowns, sometimes they can happen, but we just give it time, also giving it time and really calming ourselves down before we, it, it's helpful to this this kind of, uh, there's a lot of techniques around this with ways of communicating things like, uh, you know, saying things like, I, I'm pretty sure your intentions were good, I just wanted you to see things this way or it's uh, every situation is different, but there are general guidelines in terms of just really when we really try to see from where the other person is coming from and really humble ourselves. And the more we're able to humble ourselves, the more we're able to lower ourselves, then some real wisdom might come out of these types of situations. Yeah. All the Ajans are so wise. You guys have bare great fruit. <laughs> question. How do you utilize a journal at the monastery? Do you log your meditation hours, record your moods and feelings, what to contemplate on, etc.? Uh, I used to do a journaling right when I started out, and I noticed a lot of people at the monastery will do journaling early on, and most of us, I, I haven't done journaling for years, and I found that it was kind of increasing my delusions, actually, when I was doing journaling, and I, I have some ability with writing, so I would Sometimes, very rarely, I'll write down some ideas maybe that I have about, about Dhamma, but I, haven't, I even haven't done that for a long time. So personally, I, I don't do any journaling. And any journals I had from early on, like when I kept a journal right at the beginning during my Anagarika year, I remember filling up the journal and then going back to read it over. And it was all uh, really harsh criticisms of myself. So it was, uh, I ended up throwing it in the fire. And so, um, so yeah, I, and things, I did a little bit more journaling after that, and it did get more positive. But uh, I just found that a lot of what I was doing, the way I was relating to it anyway, was I was just reinforcing some negative and deluded mental states by doing the journaling. And... Uh, this person's this way, that person's that way. See, when you write something down, it doesn't change. It doesn't follow the law of impermanence. So, like, if I, if I write down, I'm this way, or this person's this way, then when they change, then that writing is no longer valid. So, in a way, it's kind of, it can actually increase delusion. But, yeah, some, some people might, I've, I know when I was in Bodh Gaya, I was just writing down meditation hours and adding them up and was maybe journaling a little bit. Um, actually, I did, I did a fair amount of journaling actually in Bodh Gaya because there was a lot to write about. But even then, it kind of became less and less as time went on and I was just getting more and more into the practice. 
there's a Indian person, an Indian person told me that uh, about writing in India. So if you go to India for a day, you'll write a book. If you go to India for a month, you'll write an essay. If you go to India for a year, you won't write anything at all. So I just, uh, you, you can't really encapsulate it. So I found, rather than writing, I actually found just being more and more present for experience more helpful. This is a test for me. Can you list synonyms, antonyms of the five hindrances? Is there an effective way to contemplate on them, to put them into abeyance? I think there's a couple different synonyms uh, for the five hindrances, and that's uh, sometimes they're seen in different as different types of water. So sensual desire is seen as water with dye in it. Ill will is boiling water. Sloth and torpor is water with pond weeds on top of it. Restlessness is water with waves on it. Doubt is twofold. Doubt is like muddy water in the dark. So those are synonyms for, those are some water synonyms for the five hindrances that, that I find useful. And then the five hindrances going into a bance is like clear water, clear and still water. A lot of times the Buddha talks about the seven factors of awakening, the seven factors of enlightenment for putting the five hindrances into abeyance. But as a summary, we could just say mindfulness is always helpful and also seeing the suffering of them is always helpful. So coming back to that first noble truth and seeing that, so there's this phrase used with the five hindrances, they weaken wisdom. What is that phrase? They Something like they weaken wisdom and something else. I can't remember. Does anybody know that? Well, they increase suffering and weaken wisdom. We could say that. Sensual desire. Again, with all these five hindrances, there's no real single way to put them into abeyance. So I think it just comes really with the practice. I have been reflecting on them as of late as coming in order, and that could be helpful, helpful reflection that usually when I undertake a period of solitary retreat, retreat or a longer retreat at the monastery, I find at the beginning of the retreat, they'll tend to arise kind of in order actually, starting with sense desire and then when sense desire isn't given into, then ill will, irritation, aversion arising because of that frustrated sense desire. And then when ill will arises, it tends to lead to more exhaustion and tiredness in the mind, which is the third hindrance, sloth and torpor. And then I found when the mind is more drowsy for a period of time, then it gets more restless. It gets more restless, it gets more agitated and so that's the fourth. And then when the mind is more agitated, then there's more doubt. So that's called a multiple hindrance attack when that happens. So I think they are very connected, actually, and they do seem to arise at least roughly in that order. So really looking at sense restraint, developing, developing equanimity, putting, putting a lot of space around our mental states, coming back to the breath, uh, not really making a big issue out of the five hindrances, but just just keep practicing and it gets better. On the first day, Ajahn Yaniko mentioned the director and chitta in the same sentence. What did he mean? Hmm. Well, the director, uh, in that sense, I was talking about vinyana. Etymologically, it means divided knowing and how awareness gets directed, how we're focusing on certain things with the eye, the ear, and so on. And 
what's controlling what's controlling the way we focus on things and that's what i think of as the director and the director is tanha or craving but then also the director if craving goes into abeyance it can be directed by dhamma so uh i don't know why i can't remember why i mentioned the director and chitta in the same sentence but uh i think uh what's maybe what's directing the chitta what's but chitta chitta can also be a verb so uh the chitta chitta is a word that kind of changes meaning in different contexts and don't like to go into it too much because it can be controversial but just to say that the way our awareness gets directed there's something in the background that's causing us to focus in certain ways and to focus on certain things and that's really worth looking into why is the format of the retreat listening to dhamma talks without any printout of sutta um that's just i think that's just how we've always done it uh it's not really a sutta study class so uh the the way we've tended to do retreats we're supposed to lopor cha taught us that we're supposed to just give talks talking about our own experience and talking about what we m- might think think might be useful for people so uh we do have sutta informal sutta study classes sometimes at the monastery why is the q and a in written format rather than inter- interactive verbal q and a um i think sometimes with the verbal like uh people are less likely to some people depending on people's personalities some people might be less likely to ask questions and then other some people might be asking all the questions and completely taking over and talking about their life story and stuff so this is very common and um so that's yeah the the written format i think is way better than than verbal interactive q and a in the in a shorter retreat like this anyway will we get through them thank you ajans and retreat sangha two exclamation marks are the talks being recorded yes right there hopefully it works. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, we'll post them. We'll post them after the retreat as a playlist. <laughs> This is a very simple question. Can you suggest ways to interrupt obsessive thinking? Thank you. It's <laughs> a very good question, very simple. Yes, yeah, so- sometimes there's just a storm of thinking. sometimes there's just a storm of thinking and we want to try to interrupt it somehow so actually this is it it might sound like I've just said it a lot many many times but it really can't be said enough it's just is reestablishing mindfulness because sometimes we don't we hear mindfulness talked about a lot but we don't really know what mindfulness is so longpor ban talked about mindfulness in terms of the brakes it puts the brakes on this type of when the mind is just running with some sort of obsessive thinking so it's it's running in a circle and mindfulness or the reestablishing of mindfulness is putting the brakes on that so what is the reestablishing of mindfulness mindfulness is really linked with memory the word sati is really linked with memory so it's reminding ourselves uh, using our thought to remind ourselves what kind of effort we're supposed to be putting forward at any given time and also to see that to catch it to see and even label it this is obsessive thinking and this is just going around and around in a circle and the mind is just getting hooked and caught by it so the director in the background has hooked the awareness and the awareness is going into that thinking it's going into that obsessive thinking and it's a vicious cycle so one is to look at how is the what's so alluring about that obsessive thinking and to just to reestablish the mindfulness and and it is okay sometimes to put some more forceful pressure on focusing on the breath or on focusing on butho um not overly tense but in this particular case we can put some pressure on the mind and that can actually be very helpful and to not be afraid to put a little bit of tension a little bit of pressure more than normal on the mind until we're able to 
actually calm down a bit. Another thing we can do is see where it's being held in the body. So what parts of our body are tensing up. For example, with obsessive thinking, the face would be very common, the eyes, those things would be tensing up. So to consciously calm, in those, thing, calm those things down, that can also be very helpful. Just a, th a couple of thoughts on that. Does applied and sustained thought mean focus on the breath? Yes. Generally, we, we think of this as establishing the focus on the breath and then the sustained thought is then keeping the focus there. Or we could, we could think of it as establishing the focus on the body, which can be a, either the feelings or some sort of contemplation, such as anything listed in the body contemplation section of the Satipatthana Sutta. So the body as elements. Applied and sustained thought, I think, one way it can be thought of is it's, it's on a theme. So you're allowing the awareness, you're allowing the thinking to move around, say within the theme of the body. Or you're allowing the awareness, allowing the thinking to move around within the theme of the body, within the theme of feelings, within the theme of the mind, within any of the themes in the Satipatthana Sutta. In the description of the first jhana, it says that vitaka and vichara are present, and so there's, there can still be some thinking and contemplating within that state. But as a uh, simplification, I suppose you could say, it means focus on the breath and do what is do whatever contemplations need to be done in order to keep focused there. Dear Ajans, in the Anapanasati Sutta, what is meant by tranquilizing the bodily formations? Thank you. So this is the fourth step of the Anapanasati Sutta. The first and second steps are paying attention to the long in and out breaths and the short in and out breaths. The third step is with the in and out breathing, experiencing the whole body. And it's also voiced as training oneself. So starting with the third step, one trains oneself, breathing in, experiencing the whole body, breathing out, experiencing the whole body. And then in the fourth step, breathing in, tranquilizing the bodily formation and so on. I tend to think of this one as, and again, different, I think different monks, different ajans might hold this in slightly different ways, but I think of it as consciously calming the body. So. Having done that third step, experiencing the whole body, you've, you've seen where there is tension in the body. And then with the fourth step, actually consciously calming the body. So consciously relaxing the face, consciously relaxing the eyes, consciously relaxing the rest of the body. And again, another interpretation of this is the body of the breath. I think this is the note in Bhikkhu Bodhi's version of the sutta where he and maybe even the commentaries say that the body here refers to the entire body of the breath. And so you're actually experiencing the whole body of breath and you're calming the breath. But I've actually found it more useful for myself to think of it as the entire body and just take it at face value, take the word kaya to mean just body, uh, because that's normally what the word kaya refers to in the suttas. And so He eliminated it. Yeah, oh, okay. He, said he decided he thought it was too strained of an interpretation and mm. went through with just the entire body. Okay, great. Okay, excellent. <laughs> so there you have it. Yeah, it's uh, that's now Bhikkhu Bodhi agrees with, with that interpretation. I didn't know that. That's, that's good. 
So that, that very, uh, very simple act of just, of just consciously calming the body in conjunction with the breath. The breath is also part of the bodily experience, so you are still experiencing the breath, but actually using the breathing to help to calm the body. You know. for, for myself, I, I like to feel the pay attention to coolness as the breath is coming in and then warmth as the breath is going out and that, that difference between the temperatures and using the coolness to kind of cool and calm the body. Okay, <laughs> this question has been evading an answer for three days now. Dear Ajans, could you please speak a bit about dependent origination and how one might investigate it in one's practice for the cultivation of insight? Thank you. Uh, just two very short answers to this. One is Sajan Shah said, when you investigate dependent origination and you want to know every step, it's like falling out of a tree. The experience of dependent or origination is you fall and you hit all these branches on the way down and every branch you hit is like a stage of dependent origination. But you can't really, you're falling too fast, you can't really count the branches. But when you hit the bottom, you know, oh, suffering, there's suffering. So that's, that's one way he talked about it. And then Lumpur Sumedho said, uh, dependent origination is ignorance, con ignorance complicates everything. That's, uh, that's also dependent origination. So ignorance, with ignorance, the whole mass of suffering. So I think without, without giving a full Dhamma talk, then only really a very short answer can be given there. But cultivation of insight, yes, knowing that ignorance comp complicates everything is insight. There's two more questions. Two of you have now mentioned using the word butto in daily life. Can you talk more about this practice and what level of practitioner we should be before trying it? Uh, you don't have to be advanced at all. Butho is buddha with an O on the end instead of an A. So B-U-D-D-H-O. So two syllables, B-U-D, and then D-H-O, Buddha. It means the awakened one, it means awareness. It means the inner Buddha, it means the knowing as well. And you don't even have to be, have ever practiced before at all to use it. You don't have to be at any certain level. And it can be it's just a very helpful meditation word, but also the meaning of it is helpful. And especially for people from Buddhist countries, you can really uh, give rise to a lot of faith hearing the word Buddha. You can do Buddha as well. You can actually do any two syllables. You can do, Longpur Sumedho did, let go, let go, let go. Uh, even one Thai Ajahn, one disciple of Ajahn Shah was known to say, you could even say Pepsi, Pepsi, <laughs> Pepsi. But Bhutto itself has a very deep meaning that we come back to the knowing and it reminds us to be aware and to, to have a sense of, of knowing and mindfulness. And even though we're one minute over, it's one more question, so I'm just gonna do it. Um, hmm. The chant this morning appeared to mention beings with one or four aggregates. That was probably the yesterday a uh, question from yesterday. One or four aggregates, what are these beings? So sometimes there's beings without physical bodies, certain types of devas that only have mind and even, even really, really long-lived Brahma devas that are immaterial that only have mind or, or only have uh, consciousness as an aggregate. So. Uh, as a kanda, like only four kandas, only one kanda. For us in the desire realm, we have five kandas and many uh, spirit beings and beings in the lower realms. Animals have five kandas, and many of the, all of the sense sphere devas have five kandas, but then above that, there are like form devas and different, really, really exalted and refined celestial beings that have less kandas. So, um, so we have the most khandas, we have five khandas, and we have to deal with that. So it's just different different classes of beings and different uh, 
seen and unseen realms of existence. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully I didn't answer those too quickly. Hopefully this is still satisfactory answers. And um, yeah, we can either change postures or, or keep sitting, whatever people feel is appropriate for their practice.